it's not easy for Kyrie to fit into that exactly because what had been happening was like, here, Kyrie, here's the ball. Just do whatever you want and find out if you score a bucket, which he usually did. And I think he's authentically trying to fit in, which is exciting. It feels like forever ago that Steve Nash was the coach of this team. And he he was the coach very recently. So um, it, it, it's, I don't want to say it's like a fun team to talk about because sometimes it's not that fun. But they have been playing better. There are things to like about the Nets, and there's a higher ceiling about the team, which is exciting. It, will they ever reach that ceiling? I don't know, but it is fun to dream because you can kind of see, you know, I don't know if you're into uh, space, but, you know, there's the new web telescope out there that is showing us incredible images. So the Nets are like looking through the Hubble telescope in a way. Like it's a little fuzzy. We need some clarification. It's not the web. It's not like the Celtics. Like we clearly see through the web telescope what the Celtics are. The Nets is just a fuzzy kind of image. And we're just trying to figure out, is that a planet or an alien spaceship? We don't know quite yet, but we're going <laughs> to figure it out at some point. Well, I guess a, a star in that uh, galaxy would be nice. Kyrie Irving. Um, what yes. is your assessment of him on the court? Because whenever I see him, despite maybe a few bad games here or there, he I think he's one of the most sensational players in the NBA and quite underrated for his abilities. If he's able to play a consistent stretch of basketball, what is kind of the, the ceiling for this team? Because just just seeing him, you know, with Kevin Durant at the height of their powers, I mean, there's no there's no doubt they have unbelievable chemistry. So, um, what have you seen ever since? I know he's you know he had a, I realized he had the bad game, but you know when he is playing consistency consistently, do you see you know this fueling a run for the Nets to the top of the Eastern Conference, possibly. Yeah, it's been interesting because, you know, when he left the team, when he suspended, was right before or right after Nash was fired, right? So he he wasn't with Jock Vaughn. And I really think Jock Vaughn's done an incredible job, considering he was an assistant coach on the team. And they, they are playing differently. If you look at their analytics, they are actually been playing as one of the better teams in the league, both offensively and defensively. Um, they, they, the effort is, is a much higher. There's been much more of an ethic of, uh, whoever is open takes the shot. You know, if you look at Yuta Watanabe, he's shooting 57% from three and Yuta will talk after the game about how like he's literally just hitting open threes. He's not doing anything special. Like Kevin Durant draws in all these defenders and Yuta's there and he hits the three. He's, he's like, I don't do anything crazy. I'm just doing that. And, and so then Kyrie's put back into the team and it has been there's been moments there was a moment with Jock Vaughn when it seemed like and Nets Twitter analyzed this very much like the Zupruder film um that Kyrie uh a play was called by Jock Vaughn Kyrie called off the play and then Jock Vaughn called a timeout and you could see Kyrie reacting like why did you do that and they had this long conversation and I will say, I, I Kyrie has been has been trying to fit into what the Nets are doing, which again is much more. Let's get KD the ball at the beginning of the possession. Then, if that isn't immediately there, move the ball, move the ball, move the ball. Maybe it ends up back in KD's hands at the end of the possession. But let's at least give Royce O'Neal or Nick Claxton in the post or on a pick and roll. Let's let's see what that looks like during the possession. Uh, and, and it is it's. It's not easy for Kyrie to fit into that exactly because what had been happening was like, here, Kyrie, here's the ball. Just do whatever you want and find out if you score a bucket, which he usually did. And I think he's authentically trying to fit in, which is exciting for Nets fans because, I mean, there's no question. There's like this like whole thing of like, are the Nets better without Kyrie? And which is so silly. Like they may win like three regular season games that they wouldn't have without him. They're not winning a championship without Kyrie Irving. So, I mean, th th this has been an experiment that has been happening during the season when there's already been a coaching change. And um, regardless of the controversy around Kyrie, like the you you can't say that he's not trying to, you know, create a winning to be part of this winning team on some level. So. Whether he achieves it, though, and whether Jacques Vaughn can keep the attention, we don't know because it's still new. It's still a honeymoon period. 
Um, but I mean, Kevin Durant seems fully bought in on what Jacques Vaughn's doing. Good to hear. Yeah. And I mean, you would think if, if there's any time to, uh, lay low and, and show some deference, I guess this, this would be the time for Kyrie if, if, if it's ever going to happen, but you never know. I uh, want to go back, dig in a little bit more with Jacques Vaughn. Cause I, I find the transition very fascinating and this is nothing against Steve Nash, but as, as we all well know, I mean, he just started off right off the bat. Boom. You're a head coach. Um, Jacques Vaughn, on the other hand, as, as you all know, years of experience as an assistant coach, um, kind of an NBA journeyman coach, uh, was rumored for head coaching jobs for the longest time. Maybe this isn't the most ideal situation to take over in all this chaos, but in some ways I wonder if he's almost the perfect um, kind of transition off of Steve Nash in, in that he's had all this time um, on several different NBA rosters coaching. Um, do you see that experience being the most beneficial thing that he's bringing to the table, or is it really, I mean, just the schematic change that you mentioned of, of just getting guys open shots and making everyone happier on the court. I mean, what is kind of, I guess I don't know how to frame this question, but what is sort of the balance that you're seeing in how he's been able to be this effective beyond just KD's buy-in? Yeah. I mean, it, it is a weird thing to try to analyze, right? Because he was an assi- sure. he was an assistant, the lead assistant on Nash's staff. So you would think, okay, well, he should have had a pretty big voice before. So how much credit do I want to give Jacques Vaughn? If do I do I want to give him a ton of credit when mm. like why wasn't it happening under Steve Nash? Because it is different. It is, you know, it's not like I don't want to say it's it's going from Phil Jackson's triangle offense to I don't know, just like a massive Luka Doncic. ISO ball, pick pick and roll heavy system that, you know, Jason Kidd's running. But it is bit it has been different. The effort level defensively has been upped. The the sharing of the ball, the movement of the ball has increased under Jock Vaughn. And to me, like his greatest asset, just having listened to him talk in postgame pressers so much, is that w- what Nash brought in terms of um sort of like a mentality and an ethic. And this is, again, it's pretty limited, right? Like I'm, we're not in the lock. I'm not in the locker room hearing pregame speeches. I'm not there at practice hearing how maybe Nash is communicating with the team, but Nash seemed to try to put out there, like uh, be a steady captain, you know, like I am not going to raise my voice. Uh, Nets fans famously wanted him to get thrown out of games just to see if he had that kind of emotion in him. He was very much kind of like a, um, you know, a dad coaching a their kid's soccer team, like very, very calm, didn't want anyone, any feathers to be ruffled. And maybe, and, and I don't blame him because of what we kind of know about Kevin Durant, what we know about Kyrie, you know, it's, it, they're not easy guys to coach necessarily in that way. But Jock has come in here. I mean, he had that moment with Kyrie that I talked about. Uh, he's done it before where he'll, He'll put guys into the rotation, give them chances, and you know they're not doing the things that he wants to see. I'm thinking specifically of Cam Thomas, he'll flip to Edmund Sumner, and Edmund Sumner will get minutes. I mean, Edmund Sumner came into the game for Kyrie at moments to kind of be like this. Edmund Sumner does what we want, and Kyrie wow. doesn't at the moment. Um, and it's not that he's like a, I don't know, he's not like this classic discipl- disciplinarian coach, but he is a guy who walks the walk seemingly right now. And he also is he he is a great connector. He like connects with people really well. You can tell that too. And I do think the biggest thing is that Kevin Durant seems bought into what's happening. And obviously, if KD's bought in, well, everything else kind of falls into place for the most part, right? If there's not, you know, if KD's not feeling so sure, then Kyrie's probably feeling like, oh, I really don't have to listen. And then it just goes on down the line. Where Kevin Durant is bought in, and then Royce O'Neal's bought in, Joe Harris, who is always bought in, Nick Claxton has been a different guy this season. So, um, I you know, w- w- again, this could all fall apart. It's still early. Um, you know, I'm always leery of of the new honeymoon period for coaches, and then True. expecting that to last. True. But you know, if they win games, but they've been winning some games of late, then there's no reason why it would just suddenly stop. Yeah, it is a fascinating case study. I mean, as 
as all these rosters are at different points and, and the body language and the dynamics, all that, um, you know, I, I think of like uh, Rick Carlisle towards the end of his tenure in Dallas when he and Rondo were going at it for that brief period of time and, and how that can work against you, even if you're a well-respected tenured coach like Rick Carlisle and the way that Jacques has been able to just kind of kind of command that respect and and do maybe what early on folks would have assumed like KD and Kyrie wouldn't respond well to. I mean, maybe what they need now is is that stability that he's providing, or, or just maybe like more concrete system and direction. Um, you know, yeah, again, Kevin, nothing against Nash because I I don't know what exactly he had in place, much like you mentioned earlier. Yeah, and and KD said that specifically many times in the off season, you know, going into the off season, when he requested his trade and then coming out of the, the trade request, when he said like, you know, why did you stay? And then why did you want to leave? He always said, well, I didn't feel like there was enough accountability as a franchise, which is like, okay, well, you're the team leader. You could have <laughs> held more accountability yourself. Sure. But he, it, I mean, you know, I know we don't want to bash Steve Nash, but as yeah. someone who's watched the team, he was not equipped to be a head coach in this moment. And like, if you look at Jason Kidd, I just think overall, it's very tough if you've never really been a coach. Like Jason Kidd, it did okay in Brooklyn when he was the first time head coach there, but it failed. He had a weird power play with Billy King, the GM, and the Nets chose Billy King, and Jason Kidd went along his way. He goes to Milwaukee, obviously underperformed as a coach with Giannis. I mean, maybe he gets he should get more credit for how Giannis has turned out, but... That team underperformed. They get boot holes, or they immediately become whatever they are. Now he's in Dallas, and obviously they were great last year. They're not as good this year, but I think that's more of a talent issue than like a Jason Kidd issue. It took Jason Kidd, known to be a genius level basketball mind, a long time to figure this out. Steve Nash may be a genius too in terms of basketball, but it's a different thing to be a coach. And Jock Vaughn, like you said, I mean, he was a head coach for, I think, three or four years in Orlando. Then he was just an assistant for a long time. And, um, you know, that that is a drastically different experience level than what Steve Nash had trying to come into a completely chaotic basketball situation. Is that a trend that you might be seeing in other NBA franchises? Can I take an example of what happened in Brooklyn with a first-time coach like Steve Nash being like, hey, we don't want to hire just somebody who just retired, who has no coaching experience. We maybe want somebody who has been through the system a little bit, bred, you know, has had experience under a coaching tree. Like, do you get the sense that you might see that transition? I mean, the, the name that comes to mind now she's in the WNBA is Becky Hammond. I mean, she spent years under the coaching tree of Greg Popovich. She got some interviews, but like no really feelers. She went to the WNBA and she's you know a, ch- a champion there. But I- I'm just wondering, do you get the sense that with other franchises they might shy away from just you know the legendary player that wants to get into coaching? I still think there's going to be. It's an ownership decision, yeah. right? And even though Sean Marks maybe seemed like he hired Steve Nash, you don't do that without Joe Sy, the owner, sure. making that decision. And I, it's like a vanity – ultimately, it's a vanity thing when these guys are hired and you think like, oh, this person's a basketball genius. That's just going to transcend everything. There's always going to be one owner in the league who decides – like well, let's say Chris Paul retires. Someone's going to convince themselves that Chris Paul's ready to go. Like, you know, it's just that's – they're going to believe it. Um, and as smart as Chris Paul may be, it's like it's a totally different job, right? And and so there will always be people who try. And it will be surprising to me if it works out. It's just a totally – it's a totally different gig. Just because you're amazing on the court doesn't mean when you're on the sidelines that it's going to be ultimately any different. Like I think like LeBron could do it right now because he's playing and he's good. But once you're actually retired – I mean, I don't know what the – like Magic Johnson tried. Like Bill Russell yeah. is the only guy yeah. who's done it, and he played. He was playing. That's why it worked. And also it was, you know, what was it, the 50s or 60s? It was a different NBA. It wasn't what it is now. Yeah, great point with Magic Johnson. I mean, if if that man couldn't do it, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, in, in the little amount of time that he had there, granted. But, man, I mean, because he's someone who can handle the press well, handle all that other stuff seemingly, and – um, to show why team should be really skeptical if if nothing else. Hey.